I do realize that this shirt has now become a recognizable staple of so many of my videos. I've made so many videos wearing the same mustard yellow shirt. This is not entirely because my wardrobe is small. My, my wardrobe, as small and humble as it may be, what you will realize, dear viewer, if you start making YouTube videos, is that even fewer of your clothes look decent on camera. So anything, a lot of menswear has little lines, cross-hatching, little, little fine patterns, like blue and white stripes, it, it doesn't work on camera. Or there's just something about the color so that, which, which, which doesn't work on camera. So just talking to my girlfriend off camera for a second. Were you ever with me live streaming? When I was live streaming, talking to the audience, and someone came on angry. The, one of the main ways people would insult me was by claiming that I was rich. And they'd be like, oh, that's a really nice $2,000 watch. <laughs> No. <laughs> that, that used to happen to me all the time. People would come on slamming me for being uh being <laughs> sorry, my girlfriend's seen all my watches. I, I the most expensive watch I, I own is the one you gave me. Yeah. But I don't I don't even think that's two hundred dollars. <laughs> sorry, I mean I that's okay. okay, anyway, whatever. She she bought me a nice watch as a gift one point. <laughs> but anyway. Um and and you know, I remember once also so, but the thing, the thing was funny was this happened often enough that regular members of my audience would respond to these people instead of me. And they, they knew. They'd been watching my channel already for years. I have over a thousand videos. So you get a response like, uh, uh, no, he's had that watch for three years. <laughs> or like, no, he had that watch already before he left Canada to live in China. Like, you know, specific events or something. And I remember... I remember once, maybe this only happened once, someone came in and was insulting me like, wow, that's a really great suit jacket you're wearing. Like, that's, you know, a thousand dollar suit jacket. And I still have that. It was the gray. Yeah, uh, you got it in China. No, it's actually older than that. No, no, no. It's so just, it's, an, it's an old gray, gray suit jacket. I wore it the first time I talked to your dad, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a European style suit jacket. And, um,. Uh, and, and and a whole bunch of people not were like, no, he's made like three hundred videos. <laughs> it's like you know, it's not like they were insulting me. It's a brand new thousand dollars suit jacket. So as as few articles of clothing as I may own, and as mutually similar as they may be, that's the thing. A lot of my a lot of my clothes are identical anyway. It looks even smaller when you're when you're coming on camera to uh to do these things so if you if you start a youtube channel i think people who work in news broadcasting or something are also aware of this probably news broadcasters go and they're like oh no no I, I can only buy a solid color and i can only do this i can't i can't do anything with pinstripes or whatever you know anyway you can start shopping for for youtube that could be a hit video series for <laughs> menswear vegan menswear clothes shopping uh, for youtube okay so i turn now to the the reason for making this video. This is a video that I have actually wanted to make for years. This deals with some themes that have been on my desk or on my docket for over three years that I really wanted to make a video discussing. And then there's the cause of the moment, the spark, the political context for why it's being made now uh, in the first few days of October of 2018. And that spark is, as you will have gathered, uh, the current uh, political philosophy of Jordan B. Peterson. Let's start with the crumbs here, people. Let's start with some tangible, small fragments of the, the story or the, the big issue I want to tell. In Southeast Asia, I used to live in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Yunnan, and you'd keep crossing paths with Christian missionaries out there. Uh, I was there doing humanitarian work and studying Buddhism and history and politics. I was doing all kinds of things, humanitarian and research-based. But a significant percentage of the other people who could speak English whether they were white or Asian, were there trying to convert people to Christianity or to Mormonism or some other Western religion. And um, sometimes they'd admit it to you, sometimes they would try to keep it concealed, and sometimes it would be revealed in other peculiar ways. So there was this one family living out there in a fairly remote part of Southeast Asia, and I remember they had the books out. They left the books out on a coffee table that they were using to try to, I think, convert people to Christianity or, I don't know, I, I persuade them or, or what have you. 
And the one I picked up and looked at, they were all kind of very simple storybooks because of the language barrier. The one that I picked up was a retelling of the story of the prophet Elijah. Okay, so babe, you grew up Christian. You, you, my girlfriend grew up in the church, not not deeply, but you know, yeah. you were you were dragged to church from time to time, and your mother still, I think, identifies as as strongly religious. Yeah. Can you can you from memory tell me the story of the of the prophet Elijah? Do you, don't do it. Just do you have any memory of this? No. So uh, it's an interesting one because it's sorry, it's interesting because it's forgotten. I think it's an example of how embarrassed many Christians are by the the brutal simplicity of their own religious tradition. I mean, I think I think uh, you know, um, cutting the foreskin off the penis, circumcision. I think many of these things are are embarrassing in their in their brutality and their simplicity. But you know, um, how does Elijah prove that the God of Israel is the one true God? He has a fire-making competition. And the miracle is that the God, the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, Yahweh, he makes a real big fireball. It's a miracle. And the other, the other tribe, their God, he can't do that. If, I, if I had heard that, I don't remember it. It's so awful! And, and the thing is, it's such an awful story. And I would feel worse if it were my religion. If I believed this, or I wanted to invite other people to believe it, if you're in a context in Southeast Asia where the, the religion you're competing with is reasonably philosophically sophisticated, something like Buddhism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, all these traditions are out there. Um, whatever religion it is you're, you're competing with, to have to stand up and hold up this pamphlet or this book and read the story of Elijah the prophet and say, oh, the reason why you should believe in our religion or support our tradition or, or our cultural values is because of this story of a man who lit some fire, some wood on fire magically and it made a really big fireball and some other god couldn't do that. Not that we can day, not that we today can, can produce this miracle. Not that we can stack up the wood and act out the same script now. And, you know... Um, uh, you know, it, it's such a kind of sad and sobering contrast to the type of, um, you know, erudite debates about atheism versus religion that we see here on YouTube, that we see Dr. Uh, Jordan Peterson engaged in, and so on. This is the brutal Stone Age simplicity that all monotheism is built on. Um, this tribal notion that one person's God is, is better than another. So, I mean, the other example I, I just throw out there um, I saw this textbook that was being promoted by Christians in Laos. So Laos at that time was still a communist country. Uh, it still is today. So it's ruled and controlled by the by a communist party. And the status of different Christian missionary groups can be suppressed or controlled to, to varying extents. Um, it varies from, from case to case. But there was a Christian group there who set themselves up as an educational charity. So they were claiming that they weren't Christian missionaries, right? That they were just there to teach science and math and English, that they were benefiting the poor people and not converting to Christianity. And they had a book that was um, Natural Science, I think was, was the title. Something like that. If not it's nature, something like that. The Natural World, maybe. And you open to page one, and the book read, it's all in very simple English with illustrations. What is the ocean? God made the ocean. Next page. Like, what? what is the jungle? What is the forest? God created the jungle. The whole book wasn't just creationism. It wasn't like a scientific erudite form of creationism. It was just this kind of like unbelievably caveman simple argument that whatever question you wanted to ask the, about natural science, the natural world, the answer was allegedly that this is how God created the universe. Now, again, you know, when you look at it, when you pick up and look at a document like that, as embarrassed as you may feel just as a human being, like you just think, wow, this is so stupid. I would feel so much more embarrassed if this were my religion or if this, maybe if I were a Christian who donated money 
to this charity thinking it was really helping people. And then you look at these, these, these embarrassing and, and pathetic materials. So the reality of missionary Christianity, the reality of biblical Christianity, and the reality of the fact that any religion in the 21st century is still dragging with it the ancient legacy of things like circumcision, genital mutilation, slavery, you know, excuses for the brutality of war, racism, or what have you. It varies from religion to religion. Uh, cosmology that makes no sense. I mean, I'm sorry, I've read the Old Testament, I've studied these texts. The pillars of the earth holding up an adamantine crystal vault of the sky. The idea of separating two oceans, one ocean above the sky and below. The actual cosmology, the belief in the shape of the earth and what the earth is, the promises about the end of the world. All of this must inevitably shock modern sensibilities. And it's shocking even to people in Cambodia who are not literate in any language. It's shocking even in communist Laos, Laos, a country that's communist, yes, but a country that also has a long history of involvement with Buddhism, other fairly sophisticated traditions in terms of uh, literature, written philosophy, and and what have you. Um, How now do we cope with this sense of of shock and, and discomfort? Jordan B. Peterson is now getting a lot of public interest by basically offering a sort of Jungian analysis and trying to rescue the value of the narrative, the value of the the uh, the fable, as something quite independent from um, the existence or non-existence of God. Jordan B. Peterson's position is, in effect, that um, mythology is part of the scaffolding of civilization, and if we take away this scaffolding, uh, civilization will collapse. So do right. Normally, guys, I do these videos with absolutely no handwritten notes because there was such a delay in making this video. I actually have a couple of things uh, noted down. Um, yeah, so the way I wrote this earlier was Jordan Peterson is inviting us to imagine that the mythology that sustains a good society must be ineffably good. So what is so great about a story about Elijah the prophet lighting a fire and his fire, he magically has this great big fire that proves it. What's great about that story? What is great or good or moral or important or profound or significant or meaningful or even interesting about that story? What is interesting about a story? Here, here's one that Jordan Peterson likes to quote and allude to quite often. What's interesting and meaningful about a story about a man being swallowed by a whale? the story of of Jonah and the whale. What's meaningful or interesting about Noah and his ark? And this is leaving aside, you know, the more troubling questions of uh, justifications for slavery, um, you know, obviously the unequal status of women, whatever other topical issue you want to pick a bone with in the Bible. But just even accepting his kind of um, Jungian hero narrative approach why would those stories be meaningful? Now, again, I've already given you Jordan B. Peterson's answer, although summarized in my own words. The idea is that these are myths that have sustained, I think he would say created and sustained a morally good society. And therefore, in some ineffable sense, the myths themselves are good. They're morally good. They, they create and sustain uh, ethical values. Now, one res- there are two responses to this. One I have seen others make on the internet, and one I have not yet seen others make. One response to this is to say, well, why, why this tradition? Why this society? What, what gives um, authority, moral authority, or just salience or importance or interest? What gives priority and precedence to the Christian tradition in contrast to the Buddhist tradition? And as I've indicated to you with my opening salvo, my opening set of crumbs, my opening set of examples, this is a question that's unfolding in the real world right now. Will Buddhism still exist 100 years from now? The communists tried very, very hard to destroy Buddhism. Some of the communists are still trying. Uh, Christian missionaries have tried very, very hard to destroy Buddhism. 
And I think it's fair to say they are still trying and they're going to try all the harder. Muslims, the Islamic faith, is trying very hard to destroy Buddhism. Now, I am not a Buddhist. I can tell you many things that are wrong and bad about Buddhism. But I do not know anyone who sincerely thinks the world would be a better place if the nation of Thailand converted to Islam en masse. If Thailand, with all of its troubles, ceased to be a culturally Buddhist country and instead became a dominant, predominantly Muslim country like Indonesia, I don't know anyone who really thinks that would be a net benefit. Uh, it's needless to say I don't hang out with Muslim fundamentalists. Obviously, someone who sincerely believed that converting to Islam is the difference between going to hell and not going to hell, they, they would believe that. But of course, at the same time, even when you talk to Muslims, if you ask them where they would rather go on vacation, <laughs> where they could have a better life and so on, a lot of them are going to admit to you pretty readily that these, these Buddhist countries, as imperfect as they may be, in many ways present a, a much more appealing society than the Muslim countries they, they may have grown up in themselves uh, or that may, they may be returning to at the end of their, their vacation. So this is not a purely hypothetical question when we ask, why, why would it be this story about a whale from the Bible as opposed to a set of stories taken from, from Buddhism? Now, I notice it's because of, of who Jordan Peterson's audience is. Normally, the example they give is Japan. They say, well, if you think Canada is a good society and the role of Christianity in Canadian society has been good, well, what about Japan and the role of Buddhism in creating and sustaining Japanese society and Japanese public values? And Jordan B. Peterson's answers to that question, whether or not Japan is specified, Whenever I've seen him pressed on the issue of Buddhism, he immediately responds by saying that he believes that the Buddha was some kind of magical figure equal to Jesus Christ. He gives a completely mystical and baffling answer that he, um, he grudges to Buddhism some kind of status equal to Christianity. Now, that answer is bizarre in many ways because it actually undercuts the first premise that began this, this discussion. I presented the fact that Jordan Peterson is claiming a unique and indeed salvific significance for these stories that neither stands nor falls with the claim that the Judeo-Christian God is real. It doesn't stand or fall with the claim that Jesus Christ was an historically real person. It doesn't stand or fall with the claim that uh, Jesus could work miracles or come back from the dead. And so to hear this answer uh, indicate you know, the person of Jesus and the person of the Buddha as vindicating these traditions, the, the actual accomplishments of these people, rather than more of a kind of Jungian analysis, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, some kind of statement about these uh, these myths or these these bodies of literature or the, the social world they've played. It is, it is unsettling um, to hear him say this. So that leg of the argument I have heard before. I've heard people raising the question of why Christianity? Why not Buddhism? But if we're asking this question sincerely, I think we also have to say why Christianity and why not Batman? Why would there be a special emphasis on a set of texts that most people only find interesting when they are forced to study them? whether that's forced in a classroom or forced in a convent or forced in a system of education that, that rewards them for their assiduity. Um, why is it that the stories, the narratives, the hero myths, that people actually voluntarily line up and pay money to see and hear in our time are being ignored to instead valorize as having this unique moral purpose in creating and sustaining our society? to instead valorize the stories that are told, if we're being honest, in empty empty church pews, empty uh, empty cathedrals. You know, um, There isn't an outpouring of public interest for the story of Elijah the prophet. There isn't an outpouring of public interest in the story of Jonah and the whale, nor Noah and Noah's ark. And all of these stories have been adapted into children's books, cartoons, video games, and movies. And none of them reach the audience nor the, the level of interest and engagement 
that are reached by Spider-Man, Batman, Superman, and so on. So this raises another, you know, I don't know, at least interesting possibility that even if someone did sincerely embrace the ethic and political philosophy of Jordan Peterson, this would not lead to a revival of Christianity, but might lead to a reinvigorated pop culture discourse because you'd look anew at, you know, these kinds of symbols and hero myths in our culture and say, hey, 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 if we're really being honest about it, these stories, these stories that we tell to children, these stories that children sit in their bed and read with a flashlight, I mean, you know, the immediacy of the experience of reading a comic book like Batman or X-Men, these stories that for many of us was how we learned how to read in the first place and confronted us with the first images we'd ever seen of war and violence and questions of life and death and, and, and love and mourning, that the hero myth, as it's encountered in comic books and, and this, type of, this type of movie, this type of movie that in some ways is overtly uh, designed to be children's entertainment, but of course in some ways is always strangely uh, adults only, whether it's in the darkness of the themes, the, you know, the presence of murder and violence and, and what have you. Uh, it's, it's a very, very strange tightrope that this particular form of heroic pop culture um, uh, tries to walk in creating dramatic tension and presenting these people as heroes. You know, who indeed is the Hercules of our time? And so in this video, I'm mostly going to say Heracles, not Hercules. There are two, two ways of pronouncing the same name in modern English. Um, who indeed is, is Heracles in our culture? Um, is it, in fact, you know, the Jesus Christ of, of Jordan Peterson? Is it Jordan Peterson's ludicrous, semiotic reinterpretation of the Bible? Whether that's Moses or Jesus or the, you know, Elijah or the man swallowed by a whale? Or can we say, no, you know, the, the, the Hercules figures of our time um, in their moral function as well as in this narrative function that Jordan Peterson talks about so much, very clearly that role has to be recognized in Batman, Superman, Spider-Man. And I say this, like it or not, we may not like it. Maybe all of us would feel more comfortable if our children were growing up reading Hamlet, reading Shakespeare, reading something we recognized as high literature, as being edifying or educational. But the reality may be that the education they're getting is instead from, from pop culture sources. So more than three years ago, I really wanted to make a video talking about the difference between the hero and the hero myth in popular culture in the 20th century, 21st century, etc. Um, although it, it may have changed within, the, within this period of uh, over 100 years. Um, you know, in contrast to mythological heroes, including, you know, Heracles, Theseus, uh, Gilgamesh, and, and what have you. Uh, and this is partly in response to another YouTube video, a YouTube video I can't find online anymore from the channel Comic Pop. Comic Pop's a, a fairly um, popular channel, and they had somebody in with a legitimate university degree discussing with the regular host um, basically the contrast between hero mythology in antiquity, pre-modern hero myths, and the hero myths today. And I really felt that that video, that discussion, which is quite lengthy, I remember it being over an hour long, I felt that they actually missed um, every, every crucial and important point that I felt separated the, the myths of antiquity of the pre-modern world from, from mythology today. Uh, obviously, maybe that was just because they, they wanted to focus on the similarities. Um, very few people today, even when I spend time with people with PhDs, very few people seem to know about the death of Heracles. And I think it's significant to just point out that the heroes of ancient times, the heroes of medieval times, of all pre-modern times, their stories didn't just have an origin. They also had an ending. They had a death. And, and from the audience's perspective, right from the beginning, you know, the death is known. The death is part of the package 
of the story of this hero. It's part of the moral of the story, you know, if you like. And the death of Heracles is tremendously dramatic and tremendously agonizing. And it contains elements of betrayal and revenge. And despite the fact that Heracles is physically invincible, or seemingly so, he's this tremendously strong, powerful mountain of a man, he's poisoned by his own wife. And he's poisoned through a, a manner, the poison enters through his skin, so we call it contact poison. And it is a long, slow, agonizing poison. And the pain is so terrible that he is weeping and begging and whimpering to be put onto the funeral pyre while he's still alive, while he's still talking, to be put out of his misery. He would prefer to be burned alive than to endure the pain of the poison any longer, even though obviously there's maybe there's some possibility that he will recover from that poison. Now, why does the wife of Heracles poison him. I'm not telling the whole myth here, obviously, but I think this is enough for the purpose of this video. Because he cheated on her. Because he found a new, uh, younger, perhaps more beautiful woman whom he brought back after going on a, a typical heroic adventure to another kingdom and performing various miraculous acts. And again, it is a, it is a kind of prototypical uh, hero myth. He wins the, the hand of the princess in marriage. So the daughter of the king in this exotic foreign kingdom becomes his bride. And he brings her back to his hometown where he already has a wife who then, out of jealousy, poisons him and he dies. If you guys know the myth, you'll know I'm leaving out some of the details here um, of where she gets the poison and what her motives are and so on and so forth. But hey. Now, again, it's interesting that in our times, most people do not know this. If you just raise the issue of the, the death of Heracles, they're often kind of cock one eye, like, oh, what? He died? Yeah. Before the modern era of serialized, commercialized fiction, all heroes died. Their death was a part of their life. And it's really significant to say that the construction of the modern hero and modern episodic fiction is completely fixated on an origin and on an impossible, never-ending mission. So Batman has an origin story. And, you know, very often, not always, the issues or the story arcs can be read in any order because Batman's character is never going to change. His mission, what he's, never going to what he's trying to accomplish, is never going to change. There are actually exceptions to this. So Batman may not be the best example. But Batman is never going to die. He's never going to get older. He's never going to fall in love, get married, and have children. Now, again, I hesitate in saying this because in reality, what I've just said as a generalization, it was true for many decades of the Batman franchise. But finally, the writers and the corporation, they did run out of ideas. And some of you may know, Batman now has had a child. And then the child was killed and brought back from the dead. I mean, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. But ultimately, Batman did, did have a kid uh, because the writers ran out of material. A, a, a struggle that might be a better example has been the long editorial struggle with Spider-Man. Spider-Man at Marvel Comics, he kept getting older and he kept getting married and settling down. And then one excuse or another would be come up with to try to get Spider-Man to revert to his situation where he was kind of just a recent college graduate, where he was single and young. One way or another, the editorial board at the corporation of Marvel Comics basically wanted to be going back to the same status quo. Spider-Man, like Batman, is completely defined by an origin story. But there's no destination. There's no end point. And again, with someone like Heracles, he's really the old standard. Heracles, you know, basically becomes the king. You know, he, he, he isn't just a hero. He doesn't just keep fighting crime forever on the streets. He ascends to a higher level of power. The modern heroes in our time don't ascend. Heracles falls in love. He gets married. He gets women pregnant. He has children, and the children grow up. Uh, again, all of this is actually part and parcel of uh, the, the death of Heracles. All these things, you know, come up. And this can never happen with a modern hero.
right? Um, sex and death and murder. I mean, people really being killed. These are all kind of crucial elements of any real hero mythology, pre-modern hero mythology. And they're exactly what's deleted or obfuscated in constructing commercialized, episodic uh, hero myths. Okay? Now, this does not exhaust the observations I could offer you here. As I already mentioned, I mean, I, I'm also familiar with, with Buddhist literature and, and Buddhist history. You could get into other contrasts in other cultures, and you could just say more about the peculiar educational value or lack thereof of having generations raised with really Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man being the major mythological heroes in their lives, which I think even if you grew up Christian, for most Christians, um, that is what they are. I recently taught a series of courses in China. My students were Chinese, and I had a unit in the course, so for several different classes, where I challenged them to answer this question. Um, is this a good story? for adults to be teaching children. And each student was assigned a different story. So one would be given Batman, one Spider-Man, Iron Man. And I gave them in both Chinese and English some information about these comic book characters. Um, not all of them are superheroes. One student was given SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants, that cartoon character. But I mean, it boiled down to a two-point question. One, look, in the United States of America, almost all children are raised being taught this story again and again, being shown it in different forms again and again, cartoons, movies, comic books, video games. This is a powerful message inculcated into them again and again. It must mean something. So the first question is, why? Why do parents teach this to their children in the Western world, in the United States of America in particular? Why? And then the second question is, do you think that schools here in China should teach this story? You know, why or why not? Should people here in China be teaching their children this story? And then the third question is, in effect, so draw some conclusions here. Is this a good story? Is this a good story to be teaching children? What are we teaching our children? Now, you guys will have already guessed. I think that any sincere reflection and examination of the significance of the Bible stories is going to come to very, very negative conclusions on those stories about why why do we teach these to our children? Should we be teaching our children? Is it a good thing to teach a child to blindly believe in whichever God can make a bigger fireball, to believe in miracles and magic that you can compare two religions at a magic ceremony of trying to make a big fireball? Uh, I don't think any Christian, even a devout Christian, doesn't want their child's faith to be based on on this kind, frankly, this kind of witchcraft. I mean, it's what most Christians would revile as witchcraft, but it's within the Bible. Of course, there's material on human sacrifice in the Old Testament, slavery, um, selling your own children into slavery, all kinds of terrible stuff. But leaving that aside, we know that people are going to cherry pick and focus on a few stories. I don't think that the story of Moses or Noah and the Ark or, you know, Jonah and the whale, these stories, if we're really looking at them in even this detached way, what what is the lesson that children are supposed to, to draw from this? And I think, you know, it, it's no less chilling. And it's, it's even more important to look at this way honestly at, again, frankly, whether it's Batman, Spider-Man, or Santa Claus. You know, the story of the so-called secular Christmas. You know, what is it that we're teaching children here and why? And what is the ideological function of this mythology in modern society? Um, th there is a sense in which all of us agree with Jordan Peterson, even if we don't want to, even if we hate to. There is a sense in which stories and narratives form the scaffolding of our culture. There's a sense in which they, they inculcate and sustain and maintain and hold up cultural values or at least a common vocabulary of cultural values that, you know, all of us to some extent rely upon just in communicating 
just in communicating our, our feelings and so on. You know, they they provide a kind of palette of colors that we may take to uh, to paint our own picture, express our own meanings and our and our own concerns. Um, but what's so peculiar to me is that Jordan Peterson celebrates this. He celebrates this as something positive. And, you know, I don't see how any thinking human being can look at this as anything other than, than tragic. What we're looking at in the Bible are the excuses that people told themselves for why they'd cut off part of their penis. Circumcision. They had this totally irrational custom in their culture, and they made up excuses for it. And those excuses turned into stories, myths, and, and fables. Um, you know, when you look in the Bible at, at the material there that's on slavery, when you look in the material, the, the, the Bible there about so many, the material in the Bible about so many things, these are excuses that, I mean, it's, it's not enough to say that the modern world can and should live without such excuses. I think the reality is that we already are living without those excuses. So why would we now try to fetishize them and valorize them as having some, some ineffable moral value in just being repeated, in repeating these old and outmoded excuses when the things being excused um, are no longer even, are, it's no longer even meaningful or salient for, uh, for uh, us to be making those excuses for them. Now, you know, why was the Batman story first told? What were we making excuses for? The ideological function of those stories changed a lot from decade to decade in the history of these characters. Um, at one time, Batman was an idle millionaire who helped the poor because there was a cultural notion at that time that that was what idle millionaires did. He was an idle millionaire playboy who went to social functions and solved mysteries uh, as an amateur detective and who sometimes dressed up in a cape to fight supernatural villains. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's somewhat silly. It is what it is, but you can actually kind of construct what were the cultural concerns of the time, just the very first year of the Batman comic. And then we can talk about and chart how this changed, how the themes really changed. Today, I mean, everyone knows the, the major theme in Batman is that this is somebody trying to take revenge, trying to take revenge for the fact that his parents were, were killed. And um, it's a very, very strange thing for a parent to put that story into the hand of a, of a child. And to say, you know, in this world, the police are corrupt, and there is no justice, and, you know, the people you love can be killed in the blink of an eye, that crime is everywhere, and so on. But that, you know, the way to solve that is with your fists, is by, by punching people, by fighting it, not metaphorically. And then that that fight never ends that you never settle down, you never fall in love and never have kids and never, like Hercules, you never become the, the king as opposed to the, the wandering hero or wandering warrior. There's no progression, there's no crescendo, there's no end. There's just this grief and need for revenge, and so on. Uh, Spider-Man, it's actually a pretty fundamentally similar um, sense of trauma and uh, reflection, uh, no point repeating it, but it's not his parents who are killed, it's another relative who's killed. And um, he's left with this sense of remorse and regret and resentment, and it fuels him to go on his mission, pursuing quote-unquote justice, but again, justice in a sense that's very hard to construe, you know, um, even in the eyes of a, of, of a child, okay? How is this how is this period going to be remembered when we look back on Jordan Peterson and what he managed to do in in politics in this era? I've got to tell you, my suspicion is that ten years from now, um, Jordan Peterson will not really be remembered at all. I don't I don't mean he'll completely disappear. 
But the one sense in which Jordan Peterson is is really making himself ridiculous is um, is that I, I don't think he sets goals. I don't think he sets aspirations for what he's trying to accomplish, not even to the same, you know, limited extent that figures like Bernie Sanders do. Bernie Sanders, in some way, a typical leftist. Bernie Sanders won't be happy until there's free tuition for poor people. That poor people can go to college and get a college education for free. Let's just leave it at that. Of course, he has other goals to do with health care for the poor, what have you. It's very likely Bernie Sanders will fail. I think, I mean, he's a very old man. It's quite possible Bernie Sanders will not be alive 10 years from now, just, just due to old age. But it's, it's very clear how Bernie Sanders will be remembered, even if all of those attempts end in failure. With Jordan Peterson, 10 years from now, and even today, all that people will be left with is a sense of confusion of what was it that he was trying to accomplish. And then it will be ineffable for anyone to say to what extent he succeeded and to what extent he failed. It's very clear that he is telling his audience they can be better people and they can raise better children by reviving their interest in the church and the Bible. And my position is at the opposite extreme. I think that you can be a better person and you can raise better children by replacing the Bible, by replacing Christmas with the celebration of something more meaningful. But the reason why I've spoken at such length in this video is that as soon as we start thinking about these things in a level-headed, open-minded, and critical way, I think it becomes very clear that it's not just the Christian Bible we have to replace. There's a tremendous creative burden on us in the 21st century to replace Batman and Spider-Man and a whole edifice of pop culture um, that, you know, unlike the Christian Bible, isn't linked to a history of genocide, isn't linked to circumcision or slavery, but that fundamentally doesn't serve our interests as parents and doesn't inform the next generation um, about the values of that edifice of civilization that scaffolding holding up society, whatever you want to say, that doesn't even serve that productive function in the same way that the tragic death of Heracles once did.